my utmost. Some days it just feels like there's a utmost doing some of its utmost to do something most with my shoulder. <laughs> Actually, that's probably more from the cold than it is from any issues except for arthritis. But Have you ever noticed how God always takes care of any concerns that you have as far as like major issues? You know, he works as we let him, meaning that he works anyways, but as we let go of those things that we're so obsessed with, that he begins to suddenly change our way of thinking so that we look a different way. We don't look the way that most people do in a practical sense, but that we turn it over to him and begin to understand that his ways are not our ways, nor his thoughts our thoughts. Neither his understanding our understanding. And that sometimes when we think we've got it all under control, he says, no, you don't. Because <laughs> he knows the future. And it's so much easier when we change our way of understanding to trust in him rather than to trust in ourselves. Because even though we learn and we develop and we become and put on, as they say, the mind of Christ, the reality is, is that God always wants us to come to him to discuss, to reason, to sit down and to identify with him what it is that he would have for us to do. He never says, oh, just take off and go do your own thing. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Although, there are lots of religious ideas and even dogmas and maybe some doctrines that teach that, oh, well, God's given you this power and this ability, so you go do your thing, and you don't need to be led by the Lord anymore, you know, you don't need to check in with Him anymore, you can just do it, and then He'll take you through it, and then by the end that you do do it, <laughs> you'll either get rewarded or you'll get tried, but that's not what Jesus said, and that's not what Jesus did. You see, if we're Christian, then we were desiring to become Christ-like. We want to be like unto Jesus, not like unto religious ideas. So we take our example and we always look to the Word of God and what Jesus did and said. So what did Jesus say and what did Jesus do? He said that he only did those things daily that he saw his Father in heaven doing. It says that, yes, he got up a long time before dawn, you know, in order to commune with his father, in order to seek and to communicate, to interrelate, to have a conversation with his father. Because he was setting an example not only of what we should do, but of who God is in the person of Jesus. Because if we have seen Jesus, we have seen the father. So how the father treated Jesus is how he wants to treat you. And in the same respect, what Jesus did in relationship to the Father is the same way we are to have relationship with him. It's pretty simple. If you read it, which I hope you do, then see what you think. If you enjoy being distant, then, you know, praise the Lord. But God is always yearning for an intimacy that perhaps you're not quite used to or ready for. And in devotionals and devotionals, what we do is we discuss that with the Lord. We listen to what he may speak to us about getting intimate and real, so real that we would hear his voice and that we would identify and be able to recognize in ourselves what he wants you and I, not together, necessarily, but you personally, when you spend your time alone with God to do, and me as I share it in front of the camera, in front of you, what he would have me to do, <laughs> which is always interesting, <laughs> in my utmost for his highest, the inevitable penalty, verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing or the very last cent. Matthew 5.26 There is no heaven with a little corner of hell in it. God is determined to make you pure and holy 
and right. He will not allow you to escape for one moment from the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit. He urged you to come to judgment right away when he convicted you. But did you come? Because if you did not, the inevitable process began to work and now you are in prison. Oh, it may be a prison of your own mind, of your own conscience, or of your own guiltiness, but it is a prison. And you will only get out when you have paid the uttermost farthing, the last red cent. Is this a God of mercy and of love, you say? Seen from God's side, it is a glorious ministry of love. Did you stop when you were convicted and get right with God? Or did you wait until the penalty phase came into being? God is going to bring you out pure and spotless and undefiled. But he wants, to rec wants you to recognize the disposition you were showing, the attitude you had. The disposition of your rights to yourself, your personal freedom, the fact that you think you are born free <laughs> and have all these rights to yourself, when at the moment of salvation, you gave up that right. The moment you are willing that God should alter your disposition, His recreative forces will begin to work. He will renew and reform and restore and recreate in you by his Holy Spirit a new nature. The moment you realize God's purpose, which is to get you rightly related to himself and then your fellow man, he will tax the last limit of the universe to help you take the right road. In other words, he doesn't send you down the road with <laughs> half a Holy Spirit or half a conviction or half an idea of what you're supposed to do. He fully changes you and fully convicts you and fully makes you pay now rather than pay later. Which would you rather have? To be judged now according to his mercy and grace or to be judged later according to his determination of judgment upon the world? Decide it now. Yes, Lord, I will write that letter tonight. Yes, Lord, I will do what I know I should do. Yes, God, I know that I haven't confessed, but I will now. Or, yes, God, I know that I've been angry, but I'll go and talk to that person immediately. I will be reconciled to that man now. These messages of Jesus Christ are for the will and the conscience, not for the head. It's too easy to discuss it with ourselves and to come up with excuses and reasons why we should not do something. Oh, well, you know, I just want everything to settle down first. Oh, well, you know, Lord, I just I just think that, you know, give it some time, you know, and... And, you know, let bygones be bygones and, you know, bury the hatchet. <laughs> I don't think so. These messages of Jesus Christ are for the will, your will, or his will, and for the conscience. The Holy Spirit convicting you, or you searing your conscience, not for the head. If you dispute the Sermon on the Mount with your head, you will blunt the appeal to your heart. Everyone can interpret the Sermon on the Mount, but very few read it as Jesus said it, which was to do it. If you look at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you find that Jesus said these words, These sayings of mine, I will liken a man that does them unto he who creates his house or builds his house upon a rock. And the storms of life came, and nothing could cause that house to fall. But he said, the person who takes these sayings of mine and doesn't do them, interpreting would be one way to not do them, identifying them as figurative would be one way of not doing them, but Jesus didn't even say that. He just simply said, the person who does not do these sayings of mine, the Sermon on the Mount, I will liken him unto a person who built his house upon sand, that when the storms came and the rains fell, washed away and there was great destruction. I wonder why I don't go on with God. Are you paying your debts from God's standpoint? Do you owe your fellow man something that he has ought against you? Do now what you have to do someday and don't postpone till tomorrow what you think you need to pay today. Every moral call has an ought behind it. You aren't told to do you're told you ought to, because 
God wants to show you a response you need to have that if it's love, then you'll desire to do, but if it's commandment, then you'll be forced to do. And the commandments are very simple. Love one another and to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your being, and whether you know it or not, that means with all your finances, with all your clothes, with all your cars, with all your items that you think you have to have for yourself, that's what the Lord God shared in the Sermon on the Mount. None of these things are as important as you learning to walk with God. And when you do, you'll love your fellow man so much that reconciling yourself to him is the easiest thing in the world to do. You just simply say, oops, I blew it, and you move on. God knows, and we who have experienced it regularly know it's that easy. But we make it so hard, but it is that easy.